Hey guys. Uh, it is James Okren here today. Uh, I just want to start off by saying I'm really sorry for the gap in uploads. It's been, uh, I think to the, to the day, it's been three months since the far better incident. Uh, anyways, <sighs> admittedly it took me a while to get together all the footage from this thing and look through all of this and all this, but not that long. Uh, not three months, I'll say that. I think a lot of that time was just spent with me not really wanting to go back to things being this way. I wanted to have things be normal for a while, but I started this. So it's my responsibility to go through with it. It's my responsibility to keep this going and to find answers. Answers that I have tried to find so hard and answers that I owe to people now. I owe to you guys, I own I owe to Eric, I owe to everybody. I set out to find answers and I'm going to find them. And people have died on the way. And that means that it's my duty to finish what I've started. So I'll take that as it is. Anyways. We have a lot to go through. Uh, this is all that I found in the bag. Uh, well, there's one thing, but I'm keeping it hidden for now. Uh, I'll get it out when the time comes. Anyways, so, I found this first. Uh, this is a little blue folder thing. And it is full of this Robert Kaufman guy's um, writings. And I'm going to post screenshots of these on Twitter because these are extremely important. Like, this is probably one of the most important things I've found so far. Um, I'll just quickly run through everything that's important to mention in the video and things that I have things to say about. Apparently, The Beholder is a repeated title. Um, a duty that goes from generation to generation. There's always one beholder running around, supposedly. They all have a duty to bring an end to the director. They go really far back as far as, I think, Agent Sumer? I think he mentioned it. He mentions it later. And supposedly, he was a historian. Um, some historian from, like... I think he was from Canada, but he moved to Bellingham in, like, early 70s, I think. And he began researching, like, a tribe. And this tribe was supposedly worshipping the director and... Not worshipping, actually. Uh, rather fearing. Uh, they feared their god, the director, and they feared the Wendigo. Which is their name for that white thing. Uh, and they actually viewed the Wendigo as more like... Uh, the ferryman, uh, or Charon, as he's known. In like Greek, Greek mythology, there's a lot of symbolism there that's really similar between uh, the Wendigo and Charon in terms of their artwork, supposedly, according to this. Um, I noticed something here. Uh, he states that his niece, Ellie... Keep in mind, this is written uh, seven years after he moved here. But he mentions his niece. And how they barely knew each other. But Ellie was the name of uh, Eric's birth mother. I looked it up and yeah. It was Ellie Grand. That was related to Robert Kaufman. So. Uh, yeah. I told Eric about it, and he didn't take it very well, but I suppose Robert wasn't a bad guy. In fact, he's only trying to help. He talks a bunch about how he began to research things, and he found the director and the artwork, especially. He thought initially there was some kind of depiction of the 
British white man, but they weren't. Uh, he skips details at this point and talks about the mask. This is super important. Supposedly, this clay mask that I have up here, hold on a sec. You guys have seen it before. Um, it's been very important, obviously. In the past. Oh, fuck. I'm passing out. Hold on. Uh, okay. That's just been happening recently. Anyways. This here. This boy. Um. Yeah. Supposedly, this was his. Now, these masks were used by the tribe. The Karalaho tribe, I think. Um, but they would use this mask to practically protect themselves from the uh, director. They would, like, hold it over their faces. But, um, I'm not sure if it ever worked for them. But this was, this is all shiny still, because this is an original piece that... Uh, existed back then, but uh, Robert decided to restore it. It's kind of, it's not glazed on the back or anything, that's why there's shitty wire here. But, yeah, that explains it, I guess. Doesn't explain why it seems to be imbued with things. Doesn't explain why it's so, like, significant to the gateways. Or whatever. But whatever. I don't know why Julie just kind of had it. Seems really weird. But whatever. It doesn't matter. Right now. Well, it does matter, but you know what I mean. Then he... He experienced the same thing that I did with the sleepwalking. And... Supposedly, that sent him to the gateway at the Arboretum. Supposedly. Uh... He dedicated more and more to this, and he found that the tunnel was a gateway, he found, like, all those areas, um, and then he begins to talk about, um, he begins to talk about the other world, and he actually, he's been there enough to where he can put things into a certain order for how it works. Which is so interesting. Uh, he talks about how... Uh, for one, they like change constantly. One place could lead to the other instantly. With seemingly no real order. He talks about the middle ground. Which is like... What I went through mostly during the lowest point. Though I did reach other areas that he mentions. Um, but the middle ground is supposedly the gradient layer. As he describes it. A gradient piece everything, as in it's a merger of our world and the other world. So that's why it has so many human structures, and yet it's just kind of dark, and he also notes the choir-like ambience that I always hear when I'm there. Uh, he talks about the shore, uh, which is really significant to me. The shore is supposedly a beach area. Which, this beach area, I obviously visited back during the lowest point as well. Uh, and Paul has been there. I've had dreams about it. But I didn't know it was as dangerous as he says. Apparently the sea holds things. And in the middle ground, you can encounter things, but supposedly the things in the middle ground, they're just meant to psychologically torment people, like what I experienced there, unless they're the director of the Wendigo, but the shore has a possibility of killing you with whatever is in the water. And supposedly, God, this is terrifying to read. Supposedly, I don't know. I'm going to let you guys read it. 
the horizon bit scares the shit out of me. I've had nightmares about that kind of thing ever since I was a kid. The Expanse, important to note, that is what Julie described in the paper. Papers, rather, that she left behind. The Expanse is exactly what she described. Um, then he also describes corridors which is another layer that's just kind of hallways, but they can take any form, really. Not just hallways, but a labyrinth of any kind. Um, he also notes here that there's no commonality between how people view it, and it's always subjective and always changes between people, which is really telling to me. Uh, he talks about how he discovered this cult uh, called the Northern Clarity Triad, uh, which originated from the same people as the Carlajo tribe. Uh, they inhabit half like an island, which I looked this up. It's just off the Vancouver coast, apparently. I looked up this island, and I looked up this cult, and I found a blog about this. Now, this cult is almost entirely undocumented. There's nothing about it, really, except for, like, some pulled uh, TV specials. But there's a blog run by a person, I think her name was Linda, and she has been researching this for quite a while, so I'm going to be trying to meet up with her. She apparently lives in Vancouver, so she's pretty close. That's, like, a that's like an hour drive at most. Uh, I live really, really close to the border, and it's just kind of right over there, so... Um, I've been to Canada before, so I'm just going to, um, see if I should go over there or if she should come here sometime, and we can talk, and we can trade some info. Uh, then he starts talking about how he went there, and keep in mind, this cult, uh, they all killed themselves in 2006. Um, it was a uniform suicide, much like Heaven's Gate. Uh, it was like... All the people, keep in mind, the families were all of three. Just mother, father, and child, that was it. Um, and if they didn't have that, they weren't allowed. They wanted unity. They thought that would impress the director or something. And so... They all had it very uniform. And they all laid out in the lawns and had the carbon monoxide tanks on their sides. Um, but before we get further into this, I want to mention that was where the Norclear 30 name came from. Back before all this happened, I wanted to do a music group with... Um, Eric, Julie, and Daniel. And we wanted to have, like, you know, a, an edgy name, basically. We wanted to have something that would incite a reaction. And Julie mentioned this cult. And we were like, let's call it North Clear 30, because they're Northern Clarity Triad. Um, I didn't think they were related to this. I didn't even know of their belief system and how it related to everything else. But, God, I never thought about it. Um, but apparently they had an armed militia, a civilian militia, and, and this guy barely escaped with his life. Um, yeah, he talks about how he physically touched the director. And he talks about what he felt. And he had a series of visions that showed every beholder before him. Um, and he summarizes all of them, and... This is when he became the beholder, I guess. He was this figure, he couldn't stop thinking about the director. He dedicated his existence to it, he went off the grid. Um, he found that he was practically ageless. He hadn't aged a bit after a while. That, and he didn't need to eat or drink anything. 
he mastered the usage of the gateways, which explains a lot about my earlier interactions with him, and began using a Super 8 camera. Um, he mentions here that he that he had what he called his patient files, which he was keeping on the people that he was keeping track of, the people who were afflicted with the director, but uh, I didn't find that in the bag. I don't have that. Uh, so I'm still trying to find that. There's obviously more missing here, though. Because after he says this, there is a huge gap in time from December 3rd, 1978 to June 24th, 2001. So that's quite the time jump, so I'm pretty sure there's something missing here. But anyways, he says that Keep in mind, this is like a month before I was born. He says that I need to learn about my father eventually. He's going to introduce me to this. Let me just clarify, I've never known my father. I don't have any memory of him existing. When I was a young kid, I would ask about it, but my mom would just kind of be like, she would demand that I stopped asking, that I, like, he was never around. And since I was so young, I kind of realized, okay, but I shouldn't ask. I never did after that. Um, the fact that he relates to this somehow is really weird to me. But... I don't, I don't know his name. Um, he mentions here that... Uh, June 5th, 2006, he mentions the death of the Northern Clarity Triad. But he mentions that the royal family, um, Father Even and Mother Helen, they didn't have their child with them. Then he has this blacked out question. Then only a little bit of time later, like just over a month later, he says something about uh, a foster family and repressed memories. I don't know if it relates back to this, but that is a J and then a blacked out name. Like, supposedly. So, I don't know if this was supposed to be me or Julie. I'm not sure. Anyways. Um, here's the part that confused me. Uh, so he says that he left a camera in my garage that he was going to leave for me to find evidence of all of this so that I can get involved. <clears throat> but then he notes that I found it and that I started using it for music videos. So he's talking about this thing. This camera that I used in my earlier North Clear 30 videos. Because when I saw the footage on this, I thought it was family videos. I don't know what I was thinking, but I just kind of thought they were, like, my old family videos. I think I've since deleted them, which sucks. They might have been important, but supposedly that just didn't work. Then we get the part about the house fire in 2017. And then... He notes that he was trapped somewhere for months, that his old camera isn't working. So this is the events of that My Return video from a while ago. Looks like he knew that Paul was dying during that. Somehow. I don't remember in that footage if he... I don't think he teleported in there or anything. Oh, he knew that. He just did. Anyways. I'll post full screenshots of these, or pictures rather, on my Twitter, so you guys can read these in their full entirety. Anyways, let's get to these. Now, these are all the cameras, not not this one. These are all the cameras that were in the bag with that blue folder. This is obviously the old beholder camera from earlier. Still doesn't work. I checked the SD card and it doesn't have anything. Um, this is the Super 8 that he found in the My Return video, and clearly it still isn't working just like in that video, if you turn it on, and 
doesn't work. Uh, you would hear like a reeling sound. And I, I replaced the battery several times too, keep in mind. And in here, no film reel. And I didn't find any film reels in the bag either, so I assume it's useless. This is a pretty big camera, a DV tape one, but it doesn't work. I can't find a charger for it. It might just be dead, but I don't know why he would use that instead of this. We'll get to that one in a second. This one's a lot nicer, but I guess it's just broken or something. I don't know why he was still lugging around with them, though. But what's more confusing is this. This one just straight up doesn't fucking work. Because there's a wall charger that I used. And it just doesn't turn on. And it's a VHS compact camera, I believe. So there would be no reason for him to even be using it. So I don't know why he has it with him all the time, but that's kind of weird. Anyways, this is the big one. Ironically, it's the second smallest one, though. But this is the most important one because this is the one that he was using for the most part. Um... Now, it doesn't work on its own, but I found that this camera uses the same battery as my current one. I tried charging with my with my charger, but it doesn't hold a charge on its own. I don't know if that's a battery problem or if that is a problem of the camera itself and its charging circuit, but I can power this when I have my camera's battery in there. And I got the footage onto my computer. It records on mini DVD. Mini DVD. And obviously in the last video I showed you the footage that showed how he died. But um, I managed to unfuck that big file that came after that. And I also managed to actually extend that other one. Um, so there's a little bit of footage afterward of that. So here is the footage that comes after the thing that shows the Wendigo attacking him. And here's the footage of the um, actual separate file um, that I couldn't figure out at first. Anyways, so that's about it for everything that I found. Um, I guess I'll update you guys on what happens next here, and if there are any more developments. I'm going to be talking to Linda sometime pretty soon to ask her about um, the Karalaho tribe and the Inergo Clarity Triad. She doesn't know anything about Karalaho as far as I know, but we'll see. Anyways, thanks for watching. See ya.